Hello and good day, everyone. Today, I will present to you a review on the topic of the T-cell immune response to coronavirus infections. The audio will be provided by a text-to-speech software, in this case the Voice Siri Mail United States, from the Apple company. I apologize in advance for any issues this digital solution might cause. I will begin by presenting the people behind the paper and the summary thereof. Also, I will quickly go over a few vital concepts related to its contents, though a good part of it should be familiar already. Next I will go more into detail while I portray the methods of the individual studies, following up with a description of their experiments. Once that's done, I will present the main conclusions the authors of the paper gathered. And lastly, reflect on how these results may be vital to the current situation and the future development of COVID-19. Let's start with the who, what, and when. This is the header of the paper. It was published in 2014 by three authors, about which you'll hear a bit more soon. It is a review and summarizes the findings of many individual studies on the topic of the immune response to coronaviruses, with a focus on the role of T-cells during and after infections of SARS and MERS. This fine gentleman is the first author, Rudra Gautachinapinavar, if Mr. Siri's pronunciation is to be trusted. He resides at the University of Tennessee and has published 30 papers, mostly on the topic of the immune response against coronavirus infections, as well as MERS immunization or treatment. Next, there's Jinkanajau, with over 40 publications, who has also worked on immune response and treatment of coronaviruses, as well as genome and structure studies. Sadly, I could not find a photo. Last but not least, from the University of Iowa, Department of Microbiology and Immunology, Stanley Perlman, with over 150 publications during the last three decades, joining his colleagues. Now, a quick overview of the subject matter, coronaviruses. This shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone here. Positive single-stranded genome, about 30 kilobases in size, which is quite large for an RNA virus. Members of this family infect many different species, not just bats and humans. For example, here's a small selection. Some of the bugs associated with the common cold in humans are coronaviruses, as were the causative agents of the SARS and MERS epidemics in recent history, not to forget the latest pandemic pathogen. However, there are also family members which infect pigs, mice. Note here that it doesn't always have to be the respiratory tract, dogs, ruminants such as cows, and chicken. Or in other words, if you own a farm and also have a pet camel, you might have the whole set. And here you can see a few nice transmission electron microscope pictures of the major human pathogenic ones. And the common structure. The eponymous corona consists of a spike protein, a class 1 fusion protein, so of course a homotrimer which mediates binding to the host cell and membrane fusion upon cleavage by a furin protease. Also, it's an important immunogenic domain. More on that later. It all begins with a professional antigen-presenting cell, which activates a matching T cell in the lymph node by binding to its TCR with the correct antigen MHC complex. Just a quick explanation, in the studies named in the paper, the APC usually is a subtype of dendritic cells called RDC, or respiratory dendritic cell which resides in the lung tissue and homes to a lymph node after activation. The T helper cell then multiplies, secretes cytokines such as IL-2, and, in case of viral infection, differentiates into the Th1 subclass, which then in turn activates matching B cells to produce antibodies, as well as stimulating cytotoxic T cells and further enhancing intracellular defense through interferon gamma and TNF-alpha. Here's another piece of information we need to note to fully make sense of the review. They talk about HLA-restricted antigens. HLA stands for human leukocyte antigen, the gene locus which encodes the MHC molecule. This gene locus displays a large polymorphism, and the encoded MHC accordingly varies between different persons and behaves a bit differently. Since each individual's T-cell receptor is trained only against their own MHC molecule, it may recognize others as foreign. In this context, MHC restrictions means that T cells will only be properly stimulated by antigens bound to MHC molecules they recognize as self. However, around 90% of the world population belongs to one of the three major HLA supertypes. Since antigen binding behavior varies between different HLA types, immunological studies may want to use the most common ones so that the results are applicable to the widest population. Now we arrive at the second section of my presentation, the most important methods used in the studies. Most of the experiments were performed on mice, and on two mouse lines in particular, BALB-C and C57-Black-6, 
two lines which are very commonly used for biomedical research questions, as exemplified by a citation number of about 8,200 and 20,000 on PubMed in 2018 respectively. As in bred strains, their genetic diversity is very low, and each of the lines has very well-documented traits. One of these is their outward appearance, Balb C. mice are always albinos, and C. 57 black 6, as the name suggests, always black. Also, both are easy to breed. Balb C. mice are frequently used for the generation of monoclonal antibodies and hybridomas since they easily form plasma cell tumors, and are also viable for other oncological research, leishmania and trypanosoma, or as a platform for gene knockout and genetic modification in general. C57 black 6, on the other hand, have a particularly well-defined genome. It was entirely sequenced in 2002, and since 2011, there exist programs that aim to catalog the function of every gene in this strain. They are frequently used for physiological or pathological in vivo studies in combination with genetic modification. For example, they have served as a model for Alzheimer research or transfected with GFP to build more specialized transgenic model organisms. One such genetic modification was also applied in one of the studies discussed in the review. Usually, the MERS coronavirus can't infect mice because the necessary receptor, dipeptidyl peptidase 4, differs too much between mice and men. To create a viable infection model, Balb C and C57 black 6 mice have been transduced with an adenovirus vector that carried the human dipeptidyl peptidase 4 variant, and from then on, were able to be infected with MERS. Another interesting method that came up in the review a few times was that of adoptive transfer. In these experiments, there were two groups of mice, one with an intact immune system, and one RAG deficient, which means without B or T lymphocytes. The non-immunodeficient group was challenged with a coronavirus, and after some time, blood was taken and CD4 and CD8 positive T cells purified from the plasma. These were then injected into the RAG deficient mice, and the results observed. And now, at long last, we have arrived at the core of this presentation, the experiments. To start with, I will give an overview of all the different organisms, infections and immune reactions that were observed, and then go more into detail about a select few experiments with the most interesting results. First, the overview. From the review, I have been able to discern 24 paragraphs of related studies. By that I mean short text blocks that sum up one or more individual studies to form one coherent conclusion. Of those 24, 15 used data from mice seven from human patients, and two from other animals, rhesus macaques and chicken to be exact, and in terms of disease, 15 study blocks collected data from interaction of the organism with SARS, three from interaction with MERS, five from MHV, mouse hepatitis virus, and the one study about chicken from immune response against IBV, infectious bronchitis virus. Furthermore, five of them used the method of adoptive transfer, four in mice and one in chicken, and five were about vaccine trials, mostly against SARS, among them one phase one trial on humans. And here we can see the spread over the years. The main papers discussed in the review are spread across 14 years. However, the largest portion was published between 2003 and 2010, probably because the first noteworthy coronavirus outbreak of this millennium, SARS, occurred in 2002, just a year before. Interestingly, there are not as many papers about MERS present as one might expect considering that by the year of the outbreak 2012, SARS was still in public memory and thus a novel coronavirus threat more likely to be picked up quickly. Considering that it's hard to find articles concerning SARS and MERS, but not COVID-19, as you may have noticed during your own research, one might guess that the frequency of papers is connected to the number of cases and perceived threat. But now back on topic, when considering the immune reaction to a pathogen, we should also look at the immunodominant epitopes, that is, the sequences of the pathogen that are targeted by the immune system the most. Since our topic is viruses, a pathogen that can occur both intracellularly and extracellularly in the body, we should consider both antibodies and MHC molecules as potential receptors for those sequences. Since my review only involves T-cells, we'll focus on MHC1 epitopes, which allow cytotoxic T-cells to find infected cells, and also a bit on MHC2 epitopes, which may activate T helper cells. The 3D conformation of the antigen doesn't matter much to MHC molecules or T cells, since they interact with short, linear peptides after proteolytic digestion. Nonetheless, I found it interesting to visualize the immune dominant epitopes on a 3D model. Here we have the residues of the HLADR restricted epitopes of the spike protein, found in a study of SARS patients in 2006. As he have seen earlier, HLADR is part of the locus of the MHC2 protein. 
and thus interacts with CD4 positive T cells. Keep in mind that a trimer is shown, so the same epitope is also repeated thrice. Here's the epitope that was found on the spike protein of MERS from a study of DPP4 humanized mice from 2014, which used two different mice strains. We can see that the immunodominant epitope may vary quite a bit between different organisms. Both were HLA-B restricted, however Black 6 had the subtype H2B, C3H, on the other hand, H2D. C3H is another, less commonly used all-purpose mouse strain. HLA-B restricted means CD8 T cells will interact with these epitopes. Here the same molecule, as seen from above. And to complete our corona tour, here are the epitopes found in a study of mice, using the MHV1 coronavirus. This one is a bit more complicated. Again, there are the two mice strains Black 6 and C3H, however, there's both MHC1 and MHC2 involved so the marked epitopes interact with either CD4 or CD8 T cells. And here's a list of CD8 epitopes found in Black 6 and Balb C mice, and the CD4 epitopes. As we can see, not only the spike protein, but also the viral nucleocapsid and matrix proteins can be recognized by the immune system. Now I will present some of the studies in more detail. For this purpose, I have divided the studies into four groups. First, observed immune response in human SARS and MERS patients. Second, exploration of suitable disease models in mice. Third, investigations as to what constitutes a good or a bad host response to different coronaviruses in mice. And fourth, observed successes of experimental SARS vaccines. First, the patients. There were two studies from Chinese hospitals, one about SARS from 2003 and one about MERS from 2013. It seems the original SARS paper is in Chinese, so details were hard to come by. The authors discovered impaired immune cell activation while using CD25, 28 and 69 markers in SARS, and leukopenia and lymphopenia in MERS patients. So it might be that the virus infection has somehow influenced the normal immune activation and enhanced morbidity. Now something about SARS and Balb C mice. Here, there are two important SARS coronavirus strains. One of them is SARS-CoV urbani, which induces a non-lethal disease, and pneumonitis with alveolar damage. In the associated study, the researchers inoculated Balb C mice intranasally and depleted CD4 T cells, which resulted in delayed virus clearance and lower antibody titer in the lung. To simulate the enhanced morbidity of SARS in aged humans, they used mice that were 12 to 14 months old. In the second study, the authors used a mouse-adapted MA15 strain which induces a much more lethal disease, even in young mice, and resulted in a poor immune response. However, this could be improved by depleting inhibitory alveolar macrophages, which enhanced T-cell levels in the lung and resulted in better protection. From this we can gather that the poor immune response in SARS differs between strains and is in part caused by a malfunctioning immune reaction in the host. To further emphasize the differences between coronavirus strains, here are three more studies. The first study used an adoptive transfer. As discussed earlier, there were two mouse groups, one with intact immune system and an immunodeficient one. The healthy mice were challenged with the severe SARS strain, and afterwards, virus-specific CD4 and CD8 T cells collected and transferred to the immunodeficient mice. When they were infected with SARS afterwards, they rapidly cleared the virus. In the second study, they used healthy mice and ones lacking mature T cells. The knockout mice developed a persistent infection in the lung, while the wild type was able to clear it, with a CD8 peak seven days post-infection. I assume this means CD8 cells played an important role in antiviral defense. Last but not least, someone infected immunodeficient and wild type mice with the mouse hepatitis virus. Those without effective immune response developed a persistent infection in multiple organs. However, unlike the previous cases, wild type was not entirely healthy either, and showed immune pathology which could be ameliorated by depleting T cells. Here, we can see that a strong immune response is not always the best option. Now quickly to a few vaccine trials. In the review, they named multiple studies, including a phase one trial in patients with a recombinant DNA vaccine, a recombinant live vaccine in rhesus macaques and a DC peptide vaccine in mice. And as you can see, they all showed promising results. And by now, we have arrived at the final section of the paper review. Here, I want to pose the question, 
what really is an effective immune response? If we are only focused on the disease, we could say, whichever kills the pathogen the quickest, whichever employs the most potent effector molecules, recruits the most cells, and is on a hair trigger. Of course, this kills the virus, but can also severely damage the host. As in most cases, a correct balance is key for a good immune response. I think the collection of papers in this review have shown examples for both sides and also shown that it can be even more complicated in a biological system and varies between pathogens, and differences can occur even within the same family, or between two mouse strains. Also, I find it very interesting to see all the different kinds of methods the papers have used to modify the outcome of the disease, and would like to summarize them here as well. For starters, there is adoptive transfer. It reminded me of the use of convalescent serum, a term that you tend to hear more often these days or passive immunization, only that it transfers immune cells instead of antibodies. So far, adoptive transfer for human treatment is mostly in phase 1 or 2 trials, as a form of individual cancer therapy. Of course the HLA restriction would have to be circumvented before there could be therapies usable by a large part of the population, but maybe advances in cell culture and genetics could one day make it a viable option for treatment of less severe diseases. Then, of course. There are vaccines in all kinds of shapes and forms. The papers discussed mostly focused on recombinant vaccines, either in the form of a DNA vaccine or a carrier virus modified to express a protein from a coronavirus, and have shown that all produce virus-specific T cells. Thirdly, a point one of our rational drug design professors would be fond of. New insights into the role of immune cells in diseases can also give us new drug leads to pursue. In one of the studies, Researchers managed to improve the T-cell response against SARS by depleting alveolar macrophages with a compound called PolyIC, a synthetic double-stranded RNA analog. In another, they specifically targeted a receptor on respiratory dendritic cells, called PD-1, which in turn pregulates CCR7, and thus their ability to migrate to lymph nodes after activation. In old mice, and probably people as well, the ability of RDCs to migrate is decreased, so an activatory drug might improve the immune response against viruses such as SARS, as it has done in mouse experiments. And now, to end my presentation, I want to shift our attention from the corona epidemics of yesteryear to the pandemic that is affecting every single one of us right now. First, I want to offer some high-quality sources of information, in case you are interested. To anyone with even a passing interest in virology, I can recommend the podcast This Week in Virology which I've been listening to since a few months myself. Contrary to most other media outlets, it offers a refreshing depth of knowledge, both from and for scientists, and it's much more manageable than reading the countless papers that are coming out on the topic every day. I will also touch on some of their points from episode 602, which includes a face we've seen already among the earlier slide about the authors. Secondly, one of the authors of this review has given an online symposium about the current pandemic only a month ago so that might also be worth checking out. This quote exemplifies one of my favorite aspects of science. It's always in development, testing and improving itself, and each study has the potential to be a new building block. The COVID-19 pandemic and SARS-CoV-2 may be a recent addition to the world, but it's not the first pathogenic coronavirus we have encountered. The papers discussed in the review have shown that we should examine each virus and its effects on its host separately but also that similar approaches may have similar results. There are still many things we don't know and can't be sure about, but the scientific community and most states are putting money and effort into gaining new insights. We are seeing an unprecedented pace of research. Not just virus infections, but also research papers can double every 14 days, at least one website claims. The genome has been mapped since January, and the virus can be created through reverse genetics and facilitate research. Also, a mouse model with the human ACE2 receptor should be ready very soon, providing another very useful research platform. Over 70 countries are supporting the WHO's request to accelerate vaccine development, and there are already multiple antibody candidates that should enter phase 2 trials soon. At the Paul Ehrlich Institute in Germany, an RNA vaccine was tested on 200 volunteers in late April. The University of Oxford has announced similar plans and is quoting about two to six months to test for safety and efficacy. As the papers in this review have shown, different types of vaccines have been able to create effective T-cell responses against different kinds of coronaviruses. One current issue is that diagnostical tests are still not available in sufficient quantities and are considered unreliable by some. 
without knowing more exactly how many people are infected, potentially asymptomatically, we also don't know the true infectivity, and, by extent, which herd immunity percentage we need to reach to safeguard the population. Another major concern is that of memory persistence. It still isn't clear how long the memory B and T cells created during a SARS-CoV-2 infection confer protective immunity. For SARS-CoV-1, memory T cells have been discovered 2, 4, 6, and up to 11 years post-infection. However, it's too early to make conclusions about COV-2. And this concludes my presentation. Dealing with artificial speech and video editing for the first time has been quite the experiment for me, and I hope you are satisfied with the results. These are the sources I've used. Thank you for listening, and stay safe and healthy.